Right on time. Okay, so let's kick off this keynote here. I wanted to, um, I'm excited to introduce uh, Yakov and Maritza to the stage. And as I did that, I wanted to just give you a little bit of color for something that might seem a little mysterious, but let's not let it be mysterious. There is uh, a project underway called the Ethical Tech Project at Superset. The premise of the Ethical Tech Project is to advance standards, frameworks, mindsets for the creation and building of ethical tech, hence the name. And the and we're really dead serious about it when we say the 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 advancement of human flourishing. I don't know about you, but I get really pissed off when I read about all of the liberties taken that big tech, especially, uh, has has engaged in with with regard to the use of our data and the and the terrible effects for democracy for the psychological health of young people. We could go on and on. There's a lot of crud, there's a lot of crap out there, right? And I, and I think we all need to band together and reject this premise like, well, you know, that's just how the, that's just what the algorithms tell us to do, or that's just, you know, technology. You can't put uh, the genie back in the bottle. That's just the way it goes. We all know that's bullshit, right? It's possible to build technology that delights human beings and gets us all more of what we want, but that has ethics built into its very structure. And so that is the ridiculous, ambitious uh, objective that we've established for ourselves at the Ethical Tech Project. And when you hear from Yakov and Maritza today, we're gonna talk about the first strain of that work with regard to privacy. But I also wanna just paint a larger circle for you here and let you know like we have a very grand ambition for the Ethical Tech Project because it's going to encompass matters of inclusion matters of machine learning. Uh, we don't know all the places we're gonna go. And so this is me opening the gate and letting you know, help us, fill, help us figure this out. When you hear from Yakov and Maritza, listen actively, ask questions. We want to invite you to become part of this project. There will be ways to plug in. Again, we have some, uh, you're gonna hear about very well-formed thoughts we have about how this needs to unfold, but we don't have it all buttoned up. So lots of opportunities for people here uh, to pick up a shovel and help. And let me also just tee this up by saying whether you knew it or not, whatever company you're in right now, you have a privacy problem and if you don't have one today, it's a Bruin. Okay, I just happened to sit next to Nate last night for dinner and we're talking about some of the goings on at Sturdy and there's this, there's a privacy problem. Uh, it's a B2B company. There are no consumers involved. There's no consumer rights. No, 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 no. You have a B2B, a B2B software company is, is experiencing privacy issues. And so lucky me to be able to sit next to Nate and like, oh man, we know something about that. Put us in, right? The premise again for what we're doing here together in Denver is for everybody to connect and compare notes. So when it comes to privacy, there is this issue. It might not be flaring for you and your business today but it's coming soon, and so I urge you to take it seriously and start thinking about how to weave some of the tools and technologies and frameworks that Maritza and Yakov are gonna talk about into the fabric of your business. Okay, so our two speakers, Yakov, everybody knows Yakov. <laughs> Hi, Yakov. <laughs> let's, talk about, let's talk about Maritza. It's such a delight to have Maritza on board as uh, one of the founding members of the board of the Ethical Tech Project. And she's also uh, been able to engage with us more deeply here during the summer on some of the work that you're gonna hear about. So Maritza is the founding director of the Center for Digital Civil Society at the University of San Diego. She's a partner at Good Research, which is uh, focused on privacy and security. And uh, she uh, comes to us with an awful lot of experience. Also, I like to say, and I think I make Maritza a little uncomfortable when I do, but she's been in the boiler room at Google and Facebook and she's seen a lot of things. And so she's bringing all of, all of those lessons learned to the build out over here uh, at the Ethical Tech Project. She received her computer science degree as an undergrad at the University of San Diego and a PhD in computer science from Columbia University. So welcome, Yakov Maritza, let's kick it off. Thank you so much for that introduction, Tom. Thank you. Can I confirm, is my mic working? Can everybody hear me okay? Is that good? 
All right, I'll keep talking. Yeah. Maybe move it closer to my mouth. Okay. Yeah, I can hear. Didn't it. want it too too close. All righty, Tom. Thank you so much for that introduction. Today we are going to do our talk a bit in two parts. I want to fill in a little bit more detail about who we are at the Ethical Tech Project and what we're up to, how it came to be. Um, Tom already in his intro, I think, gave a great example of the reason why I have was, I was really so um, excited to be a part of the Ethical Tech Project, because I feel like Tom is one of the few people out here not being mealy-mouthed about the work that's needed in terms of privacy and what's at stake. Um, I have worked at a handful of companies where it was really hard to speak honestly about the work that needs to be done and how big the problem really is and why it matters. Um, and I feel just the past couple of years have been, have been really great in that regard. So we have a website for the Ethical Tech Project. About a year ago, I met Tom, and from, from then, you know, we've really kind of hit a stride. So check it out. In the Slack, I sent a couple of links to some op-eds that we have written. I'll talk more about those in a moment. Uh, we're, we're out there making a statement. So we're demanding control over data. I think it's time. We've seen a handful of headlines that demonstrate the importance of the work to be done. And I think we all have a stake in it. I'm excited to talk with you all about it because we are builders. We're the ones who are building the technologies. We're working on tools that have you know, great points of leverage to um, do good in the world. And also, we are at a point of leverage where we could do great harm if we're not paying attention. So I think it's an important conversation for all of us to, to take a part in right now. And undeniably, we're all the people who are affected by this, too. So even aside from the tools that you're building and the companies that you're working for, we're all digital citizens, increasingly so, with the services that we use. Um, smart cities are becoming even more popular. You know, health data is everything's, everything's becoming more data all the time. So let's all you know, get together here and see what we can do. It is a huge problem, and it will take people from all backgrounds to do things differently. So one thing that's been great about the Ethical Tech Project is we have folks from the start from a variety of backgrounds. We have folks who are working at startups, people in industry, uh, broader industry, also um, academics, and folks from a legal and policy background. As Tom mentioned, my background is in computer science. My first job out of grad school was actually on a public policy team. I did not know at the time really what a public policy team does. Um, I feel like I was a little bit duped. It ended up great because it was a wonderful learning experience to figure out that um, at some companies, public policy is basically a lobbying team. Um, and it's, it, was, it was an experience. Um, the, the, the good side of it was I also got to see how, um, like how much work goes into shaping the conversation. So with an issue like privacy, right now you have people coming at it from a legal perspective. Those are sort of some of the larger forces at play in terms of uh, how we think about compliance, how we think about what we need to build for, where we're getting our requirements from. But at the end of the day, we all know that what's implemented in the, in the system, what's in the database, it's where the rubber meets the road. And it's where we really need to be paying attention. On the other hand, now we also need to be thinking about product design. We need to think about our users. Who are we serving? What do they need? What are their thoughts and impressions about data? All of this has been sort of a... Um, a very in-flight developing situation where you know the things that I learned about data and what was at stake when I was in grad school in the early 2000s is totally different than it is today. Uh, when I started at Columbia, nobody had a smartphone yet. I think I was in my, my second year when the iPhone came out. And then before we knew it, everybody was on Facebook. And then before we knew it, everybody's mom was on Facebook too. Uh, and then we're all carrying around our phones and we're you know doing all these different things. And before I know it, now my five-year-old is off here, you know, doing different things too. So where we started and where we're going, it, it's changed a lot. So like I said, about a year ago, I met Tom, I met the folks at the Ethical Tech Project, and initially we're the privacy track of Oasis. So Tom mentioned that as part of Superset, you, this effort is one of many examples of ways that you all are engaging with the broader community, setting the tone for a conversation, really participating um, at a, at a higher level. And privacy was flagged as a very important topic. We came together, um, these folks that I mentioned on the last slide, and I think we had a pretty free-ranging conversation. Uh, I immediately was heartened to hear 
who was at the, you know, who was brought together um, to take part in the conversation, to hear the amount of passion that was coming in toward, you know, here are the problems, this is what we need to see, here's what it will take. Um, I, I felt kind of silly as like one of the academics in the room being like, let's focus on human flourishing. I think the important thing we need to have here is like, let's really go big. Like if we're gonna embrace technology and go all in on it, let's do it for the sake of human flourishing. And Tom's like, yeah, we got it. I was like, these are my people. Um, so we had this like big two hour conversation, like, well, what do we really need to change? Where are we going? And how do we set the table? And here's where we decided to, you know, shape things up to say, it's all about the infrastructure for ethical tech. What we need right now is we need to have better infrastructure so that we can deliver on our promises, change how we're building things, let's do it for this broad goal of human flourishing. We should all be able to enjoy the benefits of tech without having to worry about what might go wrong. What we need is data dignity. We're a long way from it, and we have to start with data control. Um, so what we're doing at Ethical Tech right now are verbs, we're convening, defining, and advocating. We're convening this group of people, so you already saw our board members. Again, hitting an interdisciplinary crew, knowing that it's going to take help from all sides. Defining, so the meat of our presentation is going to be talking about a reference architecture we're working on. And advocacy, so across from convening and advocacy, I sent you all links in Slack to three of the op-eds that we have written. Um, the big thing here is we're saying, as I said, without being mealy-mouthed, we're saying what the problem is, we're saying, hey, this is really screwed up, the way the industry is using your data, and we need to fix it. Um, so if you haven't already, check those out. I'm excited about the term data dignity. I've been working on privacy for a long time. For some reason, that is in some ways like an, in, like an unpalatable word for some folks. They're like, oh, I don't need it, who cares? I feel like data dignity really resonates with people. Um, so I like that. So at the beginning of this year, we kicked off a working group where we're interested in developing a new privacy standard. And that is what we're going to talk about today. Our big key insight is that if we want data dignity, if we want to say that you have control over your data, permission is fundamental. And now I'm looking across the room, and I know you all have worked in infrastructure, and you've worked with systems, and you're probably thinking, well, we have access control. We have RBAC. We have all these tools. We already have permissions. We're doing this. Like, what more do we need to do? This is a screenshot from an account signup UI. So you're gonna add your phone number. I, I nicely cropped off which service this is from. It could be from any. It's really hard to find screenshots of like the pixels people really see. So add your phone number. It is in the name of security. We will not use it for anything else. This is just to keep your account more secure. So these are the pixels that people see and they take that as a promise a promise that your phone number will only be used for security and not for spam and not for any of the other things that industry likes to use your phone number for these days. So the key problem that we're looking at is how do we know that those words actually match the implementation of the system where your phone number is being stored and used? <laughs> right. So occasionally we see headlines that like, at big companies that you expect to do better, like Facebook or Twitter or a handful of others, that's not actually what's happening. So what's actually happening is probably your phone number is going off through some pipeline, being stored in a database. The database isn't being properly provisioned, so then some product team or service team elsewhere comes in and says, ooh, I have this database of phone numbers. What am I going to do with it? And you know, they come up with all kinds of clever ideas of what they're going to do, how they'll monetize, and then somehow by way of, I'm not even sure, maybe an audit, maybe like a journalist gets curious, maybe um, a white hat hacker gets curious. Somehow we put together some pieces that like this isn't actually happening. So, so this is just like one teeny example of the style of issue that we're looking at. How do we be sure that we are able to make promises about how data is being used once it's collected that's actually enforceable? Mm -hmm. So here's where, we meet Jakob. Yeah, and, and, and I know that this is, many of you have heard me talk about permissions and permits before um, and the concept of permissions. And it's, it, it's a nice concept that also bridges the gap or the, the chasm maybe between one way in which we talk about this ideas of data dignity, which is very much rooted in society, in humans, uh, in companies, in organizations. And the other way that for all many of us here, technologists, 
uh, a permissions ready translator, which is how does the whole problem looks from the point of view of the data, right? Um, we as humans, uh, even though being engineers, we care about data dignity, mm -hmm. but when we put on our technologist head on, what we really care about is what do I need to do differently today? Um, we've been processing, collecting, storing data for a long time. Uh, we know what a data stack looks like. Um, I think some of us have been through the evolution of the data stack as well. So when big data came out, a lot of people scrambled and there was all sorts of ideas and we put together all sorts of different architectures and pipelines and stuff. And then sure enough, within a few years, it's all got standardized and we, we can all draw together uh, very quickly a, a data stack for big data or whatever you have. But this idea of data dignity doesn't have a translation right now today. And this idea of permissions doesn't have a translation today to what does it mean from the data. And what we say uh, a little bit uh, kind of provocatively is that in the world we're heading towards, every piece of data needs to have the set of permissions of how it can be accessed and used for everything we do. Right? And, and from, a, from a technical perspective, what we're saying is we're introducing this new plane. We had the data plane where everything we did lived in, and now we're um, introducing an adjacent, a parallel, a coupled plane, which is the permission plane. Um, and that at a high level is what I think we're trying to achieve. Uh, and the, the idea of permission translated, when we started going, and, and James is here as well, it was a lot of James, Maritza, and Nick here in the first uh, few iterations. Uh, uh, Max from Catch also helped us uh, a bit. And we took this idea of permission and translated it into these five things that the permissions need to have. And they need to have it both from a, if you think about uh, every single one of those, call them permits, the contracts that is signed in some way or another when data get exchanged about what can and can't be done with it. Uh, this is the information that needs to be in those permissions. And another way to look at it is this is what the systems we all build that handle data need to be able to do in order to respect permissions. Right? First one is, of course, purpose, which is this fundamental way introduced for GDPR, but in reality, you know, we all do it. When you go to your doctor and she says, go do all these invasive uh, procedures uh, and that will reveal all this sensitive data about you, you don't think why, uh, you don't think twice because you know that the, the information will be used to provide you better health, right? It's, in, it's implicit and explicit in, in that interaction, the fiduciary. We need to introduce this idea, that, that idea of purpose into everything we do with data everywhere else. Uh, control is, is, is the aspect of trust, right? Yeah. Control here means that when the parties that come together for a data collection event to happen and the interaction to happen, they all have a say in you know, whether the, the contract is still valid. So things that we call today in privacy world, like delete my data, port my data, they're elements of control. All right? We had an agreement. Now I want to revoke it. I need to have a way to do it. And I need to have guarantees that this is happening um, and so on. Recognition is this idea that recognition and transmission okay, uh, together are elements of the ecosystem we want to build. Right? Um, we want to be able to name entities. When we, when we give our data to a company and they give it to another company, we want to know what those companies are. They need to be well understood, you know, this idea of authentic entities, even if they're anonymized. Uh, transmission is how do we actually do the act of, you know, um, and we talk about a simple operation like the right to port my data. I want my data back. Okay, what do you get? Do you get a just a dump of all everything, all the logs that came out from a, a, a web application, I mean, that's not going to be useful. So we need to standardize a little bit how, what are the objects that we're talking about, what is the metadata structure, what are the permissions, how do we create those interfaces, how do we create the, the language in which we communicate uh, all of that permissions across the industry. And then rectification, that, uh, James was uh, the one that uh, insisted on that, which is this idea that when things go wrong, we need to have checks and balances in place so that we can uh, do things. So this is, these are the pillars. Um, now, they're not set in stone. If anyone here thinks of a six one or wants to cancel one of those, let us know. But these are the pillars we believe uh, we're walking into the, the design with. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that reminds me, I meant to say this sooner. So as we get into this, now we're in the, fully in the second part of the presentation where we're talking about uh, kind of active work in progress. I think we're going a little untraditional for a keynote slot where we're presenting work in progress. 
So instead of coming in and saying, here is you know, the fully worked thing, it's baked, let us share that with you. Uh, we're really glad to be talking about it now to get your input and your feedback. So the, this represents kind of our thinking so far. Um, you'll hear more in a few slides and everything going forward that is you know, drafty, a proposal, in need of good feedback. Did you want to add anything else before? No, I think this is. Okay. So as we started to, as a group, shape up the thinking, we had these, you know, driving questions that were leading us toward, um, you know, what needs to be done here? What do we think the requirements will be? Who is the audience? We knew that we're not operating in a vacuum, right? We wanted to connect with existing bodies that are doing standards work that have been looking at similar problems, similar question areas, and reaching the audiences that we want to be talking with. Um, and so Q2 of this year, we started looking at connecting with standards orgs. Two that we identified to have these initial conversations with were NIST and also BBB. So NIST, OK, I'm going to say, and let's see if I get it right. National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh -huh. um, I'm really proud of myself for getting that right. So I interned with them in 2011, and it's a super exciting place. Like they do work spanning from, they're in the Department of Commerce, and they do work spanning from maintaining the canonical definition of peanut butter <laughs> to maintaining like weights and measurements. Like when you go to a gas station, how do you know that you're really getting a gallon of gas? That's accurate. Um, they also say, you know, what are the standards for uh, encryption and various technical things. So they, they have a lot of good work going on. Um, lately in privacy, they put out a privacy framework, I think maybe a year or two ago. Uh -huh. And um, it was written in the model of their cybersecurity framework which has been hugely successful. Um, they start from, I'd say, kind of high level objectives to say, you know, these are the sorts of uh, controls that you should build, build for, or like these are your objectives, these are controls that will get you there. And uh, I think they do a good job of helping organizations right size their security approach based on the sector they're working on, the sensitivity of, you know, the sorts of things that they're handling. So taking that model, they've then moved into the privacy space where if you've worked in either security or privacy, you might kind of have a subtle reaction to that where it's like, okay, security and privacy are related and similar, but they're not exactly the same thing. We don't really have the same level of maturity here. We don't really have the same level of, I would say, sort of um, effective worked out toolkit that would you know, really pair to all of the problems that we're having. Um, so, so NIST has done a great job of, I think, setting the, setting the table and the tone for the style of work that needs to be done in privacy. Um, and they were pretty excited to hear <laughs> I know. about the ethical tech project. I, mean, I, I have were... to admit, when we started going around, we said we're going to do standards. We're going to talk in a moment how standards and reference architecture and all of that dialogue that went on. But I was a skeptic. I was like, does the world need another standard? I mean, mm -hmm. aren't there enough standards out there? Um, are we really going to write that boring, long kind of document that nobody really reads and hates and acceptance criteria 5.3.2? <laughs> um, and then uh, Jessica from the, uh, from the board introduced us. Um, NIST, yeah. cybersecurity mm -hmm. is, is a big, um, depart big department within NIST. Uh, privacy has three folks on it. Uh, we met two of them, Naomi, and, uh, Naomi Lipkovich, I think, and Dylan. Um, and we actually, I remember coming out of the call, I was pleasantly surprised. Really switched on, um, extremely insightful, talked a lot about it being more talking to the developers and the uh, technology as opposed to, you know, trying to come from up in the legal and the regulation kind of space. They borrowed ideas from cybersecurity uh, standards, things like risk. It's not one size fits all. Let's not just talk about are you compliant or are you not. Let's talk about what level of risk to privacy you want to expose, what kind of company you are and what you need to do. So it was, it was fantastic. And then I, I'm also, I got invited and I'm part of the NIST uh, working group for privacy and I joined a couple of those. And after all this big speak about technologies, I was expecting to see technologists. But they've got all these sessions, uh, lots of working groups, coming together, putting the standards, and every single person there was a lawyer. There wasn't a single technologist in the room. So I went, ah, 
okay, now I can see some value we can bring. So we met with them again and we said, look, you know, you're doing God's work. You have hundreds of thousands, I think, of organization already that have uh, committed to or have used the NIST standards to at least figure out what needs to be done. Uh, but you are still not talking to the technologists. Everything you write here are acceptance criteria that to verify that it's still kind of what is the outcome that you want, but not the what you need to do. Uh, so how about if we had some diagrams uh, of some technologies, some architectures that will uh, identify for technologies the sort of components that they need to have in their stack that would satisfy all of these criteria. They don't care necessarily about that regulation or another. All they care about is that they have the right components with the right configuration that anybody in the organization can configure. So they were very, very um, excited about that. Um, and, and they were like, okay, we're well, definitely gonna put it in the appendix and in in all the documents, et cetera, that we bring around. So this is, this is the NIST side of the, of the fence. And then we went and spoke to organization like the Triple B. And Triple B, unlike the NIST, which more puts out guidelines, but they don't actually give you accreditation. You don't go to NIST to get a stamp of approval you can put on your website. The Triple B is an organization that does accredit it. Right? And, and the main goal there is to take friction out of the market. So for example, you know, if I, if I want to use a, a third party for uh, um, processing my data, instead of having to go and ask them a long questionnaire of what do you do here and what do you do there and all of that stuff, if they say, oh, I'm triple B accredited as a processor, okay, great. You're good. I can put that in my DPA or whatever I need and I'm good to go. So um, we went and spoke to them and they had uh, an, another interest in what we're doing. So in this, this document that they do for accreditation, there are uh, several acceptance criteria that are very technical, okay? They make a, this is a business triple B, and they want to uh, stamp those accreditation out at $6,000 a piece. Uh, so it's very important for them to be very efficient when they go and do those. But when they get to those technical acceptance criteria points, they stall. Because then they got to go and interview all the technologists and ask them exactly and understand what they have there. And you open the, you know, uh, pop the bonnet and let's see underneath it and all of that stuff. So they would love to have something like where we're talking about reference architecture or standard, that the technologies can say, look, we've built like this. And they can just say, oh, fantastic, tick, let's move on. Right? So for them, it's an opportunity to really take a lot of the friction out of the uh, accreditation business. So mm -hmm. coming out of those, I think we came out quite, um, I at least came in a little bit more of a believer that there is a, a place uh, still out there that has not been um, filled with anything else, a gap, uh, for defining what is it that as technologies, as a technology, my system needs to have to be able to, um, you know, address all of these uh, immense in kind of compliance uh, requirements. Mm -hmm. I would say that was definitely the good news. And the bad news is, or like, you know, the, <laughs> the challenges. I think in those conversations, you realize you're going to have to do the hard work. Right. Yes, like yeah. there were no partners that were willing to like kind of roll up their sleeves and be like, yeah, let's let's write this together, design it together, and we'll do, you know, we'll work with the developer community and figure out what's needed here. I feel like that maybe wasn't really coming. Yeah. And it makes I don't blame them. <laughs> I mean it makes sense. That's right. And it's important to know. I mean, like, why do we care about NIST and Triple? Why should you care about NIST and Triple B? I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to get accredited, et cetera, it will help you. Um, uh, saying that you NIST compliant is gonna help every single company. Um, I think more importantly is, is this question of adoptions, right? Like, so for us, it was like, where can we put some of this message out there to help the market adopt? Because yeah. it's one thing to be ahead of the camp, and you know, like some of us were here at Crux, we were at Salesforce, we were way ahead of the camp on everything we've done regarding privacy. We didn't get any, there was no, you know, you didn't get an extra, uh, nobody understood even to appreciate the work we've done. Uh, we want to create a world where um, moving away from regulations, if you'd like, kind of being penalized if you do it wrong or fined, we create incentives to do the right thing. Right? Where a company that does the right thing is being incentivized. It could be simply because you know, the market is smart enough and customers vote with their feet and they will choose to work with com other companies that put that on the flag. Um, 
But I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not ruling out an idea that just the same as we've seen with green energy, right? That at some point, the government is going to, you know, we, we're going to want to light up this ethical tech kind of initiative and change in the world. We've got to put something behind it, right? We've got to incentivize the market to rise up. So that's, that's why we care about those organizations. They're, they're a distribution channel. They help us spread the word. Um, and I think that's important. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we turned our attention to preparing a reference architecture. So we're calling yeah, it well, privacy. We, we started with standards, and then you had a great idea. <laughs> yeah. So first we called it standards for the longest. Yep. yep um, so we're thinking we do standards. That's right. And then maybe you should say why we went from standards to a reference architecture. Yeah. So can I do it by talking about Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do that, that first. All right. So folks, my big thing is human-centered research. And so I always have to start from the perspective of who is actually going to use it. Like, who is it that's doing what, and what are we going to ask them to do instead? And so probably for about like four to five weeks running, I would get on Zoom with Yaakov and be like, so who's our audience? And he'd say something. And I'd be like, I feel like we need to refine that. And then I'd come back the next week and be like, yeah, but who's the audience? And he'd tell me again. And I'd be like, can we refine that some more? Um, and finally, I think we came up with a, and to me, like these are, in my session yesterday, I was talking a lot about like the problem framing. Like, this is always the hard part, right? Figuring out exactly like who are the people, what is it that they're doing when they need the solution that you're talking about? And we settled on technologists. So as we're talking about, you know, like permission is fundamental. You know, as you know, I'm telling this big story about like, well, we need the pixels to actually match the system implementation. We have to start first with the people who are architecting the systems, designing the systems, developing the tooling, working with the tooling, and working with the data. So that's where we're starting first. And we realize that, you know, I feel like we're kind of, um, we, we know that we need to be in these conversations with interdisciplinary folks and have relevance and connections with legal and policy. We need to know what it takes to be compliance. We need to know how we're connecting to the broader world and, and the users and all that. And then we also know that, you know, the technical work, we're, we're closest to it. So we need to do that first. So we're working on the reference architecture. We will probably get to standards later, but we're not doing standards for standards sake. If for adoption it takes writing a standard, we'll do it. But if we can solve all our problems with a reference architecture, maybe we'll stop there. Yep. So in addition to you know badgering about who's our audience, I also badgered a lot about our problem statement. Um, and do you want to read it off, or do you want to? No, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's clear, right? So I think everything we said so far, right? The the it's a, it is a different voice out there. You know, I know when we talk about the the ethical tech project, you'll hear a lot of the language that is more referring to you know human rights and personal rights, and very much coming from the society, from the person, from the organization perspective, from the human world we live in. Uh, it was important for us that everything we do here is not about um, the more uh, esoteric data dignity and, and, and all of that, but m a lot more about the bolts and nuts of, you know, it's a technology. We need to empower technologies. We need to build architectures. We need to have the technology in place. It doesn't just, you know, it needs to prove uh, the test of time as well. It can't be like, okay, now another regulation comes out. We're going to change everything. So it is really about the foundational pieces that a technology, a modern data stack technology needs to have um, to be able to kind of move into this world of a permission data economy. Should I take questions? Mm, we can. Uh, how are we going for time? Is it a, a 12 or a? Um... OK, so we should probably press on. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. All right, so, uh, so just quickly, what is a reference architecture? It's a common vocabulary, right? I mean, the, the main thing, and you all guys know that, so I, I'm not going to, we don't have to spend here a long time. But the key thing is, reference architecture is not meant to be implementable. It's not an implementation architecture. It's one level above. It's the what rather than the how, OK? It needs to give the guidelines. It needs to define what it is that we're trying to build. And then it leave, needs to leave the details for whoever, whoever technologies to come up with the how. Uh, so Catch, for example, just to poke at it, builds a lot of the how of, of, of these modern reference architecture. Okay? There's other providers out there. There are uh, technologies out there that chose to build in-house some of that how. 
that's fine as well, right? But at least we have a common language about what is it that we're trying to build. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's the stuff that we're going to include in our reference architecture. And this is where we're going a little bit of the well-defined stuff into more and more of the work in progress. But um, we're thinking about four data stack architectures that we're going to address. And it's kind of progressive. Uh, and I'll show you in a moment. We'll start with a very simple one, move to a more advanced uh, application kind of use case, a processor, and an ecosystem. right? And they gradually build on top of each other. Um, uh, again, this is James had a great uh, it threw us in a great direction here. We took a leaf out of a, a, a fantastic blog post. Actually, I'll send the link afterwards uh, on how to how to you know how to define the technologies a little bit. What it is that needs to be built. So we're going to talk about components and component design. And a lot of the component design is about these flows, which I'll show you in a moment. It's about these functions we need to do. So here's an example. It's not a complete, but some subset of the flows, right? As we call them, that a modern data stack that respects uh, privacy and et cetera uh, needs to have. Like, this needs to be this idea of permission collection. Where does that fit? Uh, what components serve that? Uh, there's this idea of today data subject rights fulfillment. What components are required for that? Where does it fit? How does it change the flow we have today? Purpose limitation data access and processing. Well, what do I do to my current data access control and my current data processing to be able to satisfy this purpose limitation? What are the components involved? What are the flows that are going to be introduced? And so on and so on and so on. Um, and then also the definition of some interfaces and APIs, right? Because we like those. We make. Uh, now, this is not going to be a prescribed API like you have to do this, but rather here's some of the, you know, um, some of the conditions that need to be true for that API uh, mm -hmm. in the interface. So, um, very simple application, right? So this is an example of a simple application. Just some client, a server, and a database. Uh, what do we do there? Um, so let's, let's take one click. So here is a list of components. Um, might be hard to read. We'll probably share that around. Um, naming of these, I suspect, will shift. You know, naming is hard. We all know that. Um, we're going to have to iterate of those. But the main thing I want you to take away from it is that we're naming thing, the privacy, privacy stack explicitly. So we're saying that in the future, for us to do data the way we do, as well as a data stack, you need a privacy stack. And that privacy stack has some components. So for example, permission management is a module, uh, it's a component that you're going to have, which will describe in a moment some of the elements of its design, right? that you're going to have to implement, or purchase, or partner, or do something. But you're going to have to have it in your stack. Uh, same goes for data policy authoring service, right? Like you're going to have to, uh, to have a way as an organization to define all the policies that govern your data, everything that can and can be done with your data. Okay. And so, just to show an example of one of those component uh, design ideas, here's a flow. And I should point out that that Ryan, uh, which you all know and love, uh, uh, mm -hmm. is joined also the group here to help us. He's been working from the catch side on developer front, and that how to you know, bring the, get the gospel over to the developers. Uh, this is a match made in heaven, so we're going to work together on doing some of those. Um, so the idea is to say, look, if you take the purple color out, use a browser server for a simple app. We all know that. That's what we've been doing all along. Okay? How does now, when we want to do privacy, how do you add privacy into that flow? Okay? What does a component called permission management needs to do to be able to adjust into the world that we already know. Okay? And we're going to draw a lot of those that. So there'll be a, a flow for data uh, DSR. There's going to be a flow for, for other components. Um, and then there's, 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 there's some ideas on API. So this is actually early work at Catch uh, with Seth as well. Um, so this is, this is straight out of there. But the, the idea that you can describe interfaces for permissions, for example, through some interfaces. Right? Like, here's what a simple interface for permission needs to do. Right? And again, as a technologist, you look at that. You can either go and implement something like that. And we will, we will supply some uh, uh, implementations, uh, reference implementations. Uh, but you can also go and you know, check if you need to acquire a, uh, uh, the service. Are they, are they doing the thing that you need to do? All right. Mm -hmm. And just moving quickly, so we're not going to go through all of those, each one of them, but an advanced application uh, builds on the idea of a simple application. So now you have some third party uh, uh, um, um, services as well and some more complex backend. Um, so then if you come one more to the, to the flow, we click another one, um, you can see that now there's, there's, there's a dedicated third party aspect of the flow and how they interact with your website. And then you add the privacy on that. 
what are the minimum requirements you need to make that work, okay? What does the components now permissions look when you have third parties involved? Um, and then, you know, we'll go to the processor application, and that's, a, again, another layer of complexity, and all the way over to um, data supply chains and ecosystems. Some of you know that's my, that's my, where, this is where my heart lives in, when we go to that scale. Uh, but, but this is where it really talks about how do we start communicating permissions between an organization and add all of the complexity that is required there. Mm -hmm. All right. So what's next? We gave you a very um, high level view of where we're going with the details and kind of the work ahead. For the rest of this year, we're going to be working on building out and specifying the reference architecture. Um, so if any of this has piqued your interest and you either think, if, if, if it brought to mind issues that you're currently thinking about, where you want to plug in, where you have feedback, where you want to dig into the nitty gritty of these docu uh, diagrams and, and contribute, please reach out to one of us and we'll be in touch and we'll figure out how to, you know, how do we get your input and feedback and work together. Um, again, we're focused on technical audience. We're looking at those handful of archetype, archetype examples to really build it out and demonstrate what's going on. Next year, we're looking at hopping back into contextualizing the work into a broader sense, reconnecting with these audiences from policy and legal, helping them understand uh, you know, why is this work needed? What, what, is, what are the implications of a reference architecture amidst broader questions they might have or other efforts? Um, and also just more broadly expanding our audience. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This one. Thanks. Um, so, question for you. So, the reference arch architecture stuff makes a lot of sense to me. I also think that jives with the talk we heard yesterday from Professor Mickens. The part where I'm less sure of is the permissions and anchoring on permissions. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's an easy answer I hope you don't give me, but but why do we do that? I don't focus a lot on how my data is used today. I'm sure it's being misused in ways. Mm -hmm. If you give me an easy set of permissions, I'm going to uncheck all of them for the simple reason that I'm not going to read it in the same way that I don't read privacy policies or some emails that my wife sends me. So like, <laughs> why, why are yep. we? Health is a human right in some people's minds. We don't go to every person and make them, you know, read their own x-rays. Like, wh why, why permissions? Yeah. Do you, do you want to take it? Or? I'll take it. Or okay. I'll, I'll answer, then you can go. OK. Yeah. So I think building off of James's talk from yesterday, I think one thing that we could start doing in the privacy space is to build up more reliable uh, socio-technical systems. So when we all fly home, either tonight or tomorrow, none of us is going to walk up to the pilot and say, this is safe, right? Prove it. We have systems, we have you know, professionals, we have standards, we have a ton of different trainings and checks so that we don't pretend that it is our individual responsibility to ensure the safety of the aviation field at large. So I feel like one of the things that I would love to see from like, the human-centered perspective would be introducing more space so that we can have a layered approach to it so that we can delegate some of that authority. So then, while we are building up a system where permission is foundational and fundamental to it, it doesn't necessarily mean that every individual is going to be there individually managing and tinkering with all these knobs and levers that we're putting into place. Mm -hmm. So that's like, that, OK, is that satisfying? Yeah. I, can I just add one thing? I mean, first of all, a lawyer in a cowboy hat, I don't think I'm ever going to get a question from someone like that <laughs> ever again in my life. Um, the second thing is, uh, I also want to make the distinction here that permissions, of course, you're, you're steeped in the consent kind of world and you understand it from the human permission granted to us something. The, the, the notion of permission here is a lot more um, in the weeds. It's really about systems and data and permissions. You know, when, when the traffic light IoT device talking to what, that, that it's, it's on that level permissions. Yes, there is a link, it has to be back out to what permissions are in the, the rest of the world, like notions of consent. Um, so they are translatable. But there's a whole aspect of permission. So you're right. You don't go and, you know, like there's a, there's a fiduciary relationship, you know, your lawyer or with your doctor, that happens there explicitly. You don't need to give permissions. They're, they're almost implicit. So I think that will happen too. Thank you. Um, again, 
um, this is one of my favorite topics, like <laughs> privacy and, and misinformation. Um, and I think a lot about it. So the question of privacy has come in, you know, you know we, we start thinking about it because most of the consumer tech, like trillion dollar companies of the era have been created on the back of our data, which they sell, which they exchange without our permissions, right? And these are the companies that control most of the technologists, the best minds in the world, with all the PhDs from the top schools, work on how they can use the psychology and technology to make us click more, to watch more junk, and to become less productive in the world, right? <laughs> and that's what, I mean, it has happened in the last 10 years, our attention span has dropped below that of a you know, goldfish. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now, I like, I think most of the standards, like NIST, you know, like you did TCP, ICP, all these were created to solve a problem, right? And the big tech was incentivized to solve that. In this case, you're actually killing their monopoly. You're telling them you cannot actually breed on, on humans, right? How do you, what is your thought process in getting the support from this big tech? Yep. Do you want to go? No, I feel like this is like, this is your this stake is it. now. This, this is, is it. This is, this is. <laughs> jam it I in. I give it over to you. <laughs> I'm going to jam it Show in. Show us the way. So, first of all, I mean, I, I can talk for hours on, on a, lo a lot of those questions. I think quickly, though, you are absolutely right. Up to this point, uh, when as humanity, our, our job was to take this thing called the internet and create huge adoption. And the metrics we picked were for adoption. We looked at clicks and unique users and everything, and we valued companies based on that because the job was really not about getting, you know, it wasn't the quality, it was the quantity, okay? But I think we all feel, I, I often say, you know, they, uh, Eric Schmidt was asked in 2004, somebody said, hey, my son is on the internet all the time, and he said like, that's okay, so turn it off. Just have it on an hour or two. He wrote a book recently with, with Kissinger, and he was asked again, he's like, you can't turn it off. We're all there, we're 24-7. You cannot turn off the internet. So I think if you take it from a historian perspective a little bit, I think we are living at a time where we are all agreeing internet has been adopted. What we need to figure out now is how do we take this and turn it into meaningful? Now you're right to say, look, these companies hold on all the data today and they're doing all this stuff. But if you think about it for a moment, Facebook data is garbage. You know, it is. I mean, you go on there, you say, oh, I'm on a fantastic holiday with my wife. And then you go to Google and you search, you know, for a divorce lawyer. I mean, it's garbage. You know, the good data sits in hospitals. It will sit in your car that drives you. It will sit in the smart cities, in the smart homes. That's the really good data. I think all of this work is trying to unlock the ability for our algorithms and our system to take that good bunch of data and put it to work. Now, yes, thank you to Google. They have built, and all the rest of those uh, adoption companies, they built great technologies like big data and AI didn't exist, wouldn't exist without the huge amount of uh, effort they pumped into it. But like, like I was talking with, with James yesterday, it's the externalities. So say, you've built all of that, great, you're gonna die and disappear. We're gonna take that technology, we're gonna put it to work into something that actually delivers value, and we're gonna move on. Because we do, you know, we, we all wanna have healthier life, we wanna have you know, uh, uh, all, the, all the benefits that AI can drive for each one of us every day beyond just you know, Facebook. So I do think we're heading that way. Uh, they might come for the ride or not, that's up to them, but they'll, they'll yeah. you know. No, I, I partially agree with you about the Facebook data being garbage because that's the same data that actually fits in the election for this of this country. Right? If it's that spread would have been garbage, people would have sent this more, you know, in, in a nice way. But it didn't happen, so that data definitely is not garbage. Yeah. Uh, the point is, the, that's the second point. We don't understand how important this data is because it kind of, there's actually a cycle. Mm -hmm. We feed data and the system feeds us data back. Mm -hmm. And that changed, that's the misinformation thing. And that's changed how we think, how mm -hmm. we read the world around us. Mm -hmm. I can give you an example. For example, in India, as you were mentioning, because of misinformation. Yep. Mm -hmm. I remember. And, 
So in India, lynching happened because misinformation spread. That's right. And the platform that was responsible for that is WhatsApp and, and Facebook. That's right. So we fed it some data, it fed it back to the people, and the reaction was that, okay, somebody died. And, and my, my, my point it, is... It, it, it happens, right? I mean, I, and I don't know for time, we can catch up later on, but when print came out, for 150 years there were wall. I mean, that's true. That's what print did. You know, when, when they mass produced prints and now started printing books and that, the, 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 it caused war for 150 years. Like, it takes time. You're right. We need, there's a lot to figure out there. Um, I'm not saying not, but um, yeah, let's catch up on some of that. Any other questions? Sam, go. So uh, all these uh, components and reference user flow uh, make a lot of sense to implement for a, a project or a company that's starting from the ground up uh, and can think about these pieces at design time. Mm -hmm. The thing I'm curious about is how you think about meeting uh, technologists and companies where they are today with the, the systems that they currently have in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So. Uh, I mean, first of all, being a reference architect is you have the, uh, the privilege to go, uh, you know, it's like the mathematician, let there be whatever. So, I mean, you just, <laughs> he, he, here's the world you need to be in, figure out the details, you know, the proof is left for the, for the reader. No, but uh, jokes aside, I think when we go to create implementation, reference implementations, we're gonna have to address that. And so to your point, it's, it's, it's a simple application but it can have legacy, right? And there'll be modules there that need to uh, address the legacy aspect. And there'll be choices. You know, you, you put a line in the sand and you move on. You uh, deploy this other module to update it all and be in the new world. But at least I think this will paint the world you need to be in. And then we'll figure out how we get you there. Um, look, if we do it right, I mean, Industries should be born around that, right? Like that, that like, like SOC2, there's companies that go in accredited and they come and tell you. There's consultancies that come and help you become SOC2 compliant. So you, you can imagine that once there is a understanding in the market of what needs to happen, the market being efficient, they will come up with solution of how to make it happen. Mm -hmm. I think it'll be interesting too as time goes on. Uh, maybe there will be certain data types that where we've decided they're um, more sensitive or less sensitive, or certain sectors or certain uses of data, where we, I guess, it, I feel like it's, it's kind of hard to say that you know everything needs to be rebuilt to be in this way. But then at the same time, it, you know, it, it, it's hard to say that um, it's just it, it's hard to know what we can say about how our data is being treated based off of how systems are being built today. So I think at some point there may have to just be a reckoning of like, well, do we? Do we decide to embrace this amazing reference architecture now that it's here, or do we ignore it and pretend still like we can't really have control over data and distributed systems? Yeah. And maybe we can't. I'm not sure. Um, and it happened in the past, right? Like so, I mean, we've been part of organization where you know they had databases, relational databases. Big data happened, and they didn't want to let go of it, so they keep on making the relational databases bigger and bigger and bigger, and figure out ways around that. Well, that's okay, fine. Eventually, they had to give into something. So these transitions happen. Um, and legacy, dealing with legacy is a big issue, but it was something we've done before. Any other questions? Last one. Last question, Nick says. Okay. So a lot of these is also dependent on technology, I believe. Like there are no technologies available or there are technologies which are very costly to do like um, private set intersection or those kind of compute, right? So do you think that is also something that you guys are planning to help with or uh, provide technologies for? Is, is that even something that you guys are planning for? Um, no, so if I can repeat the question to understand, so you're saying that the reality is that when you um, accept that you want to operate in this ethical way, certain things that we are used to do with data, like set intersection, uh, doing it in a way that com you know is, is uh, complies with everything we want here makes the operation very expensive. You know, and James spoke a little bit about you know examples like that elsewhere. Um, I don't think we will not. The reference architecture is not going to necessarily create new solutions. That's not the idea. It would it would point to technologies 
uh, and maybe you noticed there was a component there called, uh, we call it fortification, we call it fortification at catch, maybe there'll be another name, but this idea of statistical anonymization and, and ways in which you could do operations in that. Um, but we're not gonna design new algorithms here or try to do the math for how to do it. That's not the, that's not the purpose of the reference architecture. Um, I would say though that, you know, like, if, if again, if I look at other examples, you know, it used to be that you didn't have the options, then you had the option to ask whether you want your hard drives to be encrypted or not on your laptop, uh, and then eventually it became the default. You get your laptop today by default at that. Why? Because hardware uh, has had accelerators on that to do the whole I.O. on the hard drive with encryption, like, it doesn't matter to you. Does it cost? Yes, it costs a little bit, but nobody cares. Uh, so I think I think the industry will rise up to that as well. You know, it's like HTTPS, right? Like I mean, like yeah, we, we it was a pain. There was a thing. Not everybody went on, but here we are, right? I, I think it will. I think it will evolve. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, so work in progress. We have much more to do, much more to come. Uh, we'll share the slides if you have any. Any questions or feedback you're dying to share, we would love to hear yeah. uh, in whatever format and you want to share. You want volunteers, right, for, for some survey? Yes, eventually, yeah, we'll be reaching out for volunteers who wanted to, who are in these roles that we're targeting so that we can get feedback. So be surveys, interviews, we'll see.